just to make sure people are in the right place, giving a talk on WebAssembly and databases. Uh, so who am I? Um, I'm a founding engineer at MotherDuck. MotherDuck is uh, about a year ago, we, um, uh, the company was founded with kind of a vision to uh, change the core way that databases are structured with really leveraging the core backing technology of DuckDB. Uh, someone's in mind, can someone get the back door? Thank you. Um, with uh, using a core technology called DuckDB. DuckDB is an embedded database, um, which was founded with the principle of current databases, especially how they're structured component-wise, or just a pain to deal with. Most people use like Postgres and really databases that were created in the 80s plus ago. Um, so they've, um, Hans and Mark kind of founded with the idea of um, creating a modern database that they actually like developing in. So we built the service layer on top of that that actually brings it into the cloud and provides it as software as a service um, with the vision of usability and accessibility. Um, uh, apart from that, I've been in and out of kind of databases and uh, data tier itself, working various companies, Samsung, OpenX, Teradata, Matisse as core developer, as a core developer in database land itself, as well as growing kind of data teams at scale. All right, so the rough structure of this talk, um, essentially I'm gonna start with kind of state of the world in databases, or sorry, state of the world of WASM in databases, and then move on to some of the problems, like what problems I see WASM is trying to solve in the database um, land, and then talk about really the, what I see as the road ahead. So broken down three parts, where we are right now, what's kind of the cutting edge of, well, it's all pretty bleeding edge, but what's like really up next and in progress of development, and then what's kind of far out in the horizon. Uh, the talk itself was a little complicated and it's only 30 minutes, so I kind of dive directly into a lot of the um, mechanics and and jargon, et cetera. So ask any questions, stop me at any point in time. If anything's unclear, I definitely prefer conversations as opposed to giving speeches, but uh, we will also manage time accordingly. Um, so state of WASM and databases. So the core place that WASM is being leveraged in databases right now are UDFs, user-defined functions. There's a whole family of user-defined functions, um, but roughly they're broken down into, essentially it's the developers being able to run untrusted code inside a database itself. Um, the kind of core idea is to push logic that's traditionally in um, application land into the database itself to run for better performance characteristics. Uh, the downside is that whenever you push data into, as opposed to using traditional SQL, you lose the optimizations on top of this. Um, now, core question you can ask is why would you make this trade-off of losing optimization? Essentially, it's because SQL is kind of a pain in the butt and we're developers. So you wanna have the full richness to be able to, full richness um, to be able, uh, full richness and expressiveness of an MP complete language to be able to solve business real world problems. So any real complicated complex business logic usually breaks down into some UDF that's being run in the system itself because you get variables looping, branching, which traditionally are very difficult to do in SQL. Um, more advanced databases have their own like Oracle has PUSQL, which is adding procedures on top of SQL. And there are different variations like that to add these sort of same things to R but the only industry really practice and the only thing that's recognized kind of industry-wide is UDFs in the system. So that's really the only way you can get cross-compatibility between, or some semblance of cross-compatibility between databases. Uh, so the other kind of um, branch of where WASM is being used in databases is actually to embed an entire database in WASM. So this allows WASM to run on the edge 
um, as well, well, edge, depending on uh, old definitions of edge. So traditionally, this is actually in the browser, but lately there's been pushes to actually get this to run on edge servers. Um, so that's using WASI and um, that whole branch of, of uh, WASM <laughs> cutting edge development. Um, the databases on the edge itself, um, so both SQLite and DuckDB are, have embeddings in the browser. Um, SQLite itself, actually Chrome is switching off of using IndexedDB to using uh, an embedded SQLite in order to power all of the SQLite functionality and um, the document store in your browser itself. Uh, the <laughs> grade Postgres out there um, is, so there is a version of Postgres that's been embedded. It's actually Postgres running in a VM that's running on top of, um, running on top of, or running embedded in WASM, which just shows the power of WASM, <laughs> the capabilities that we can actually do that. Practically, how performant it is, et cetera, is kind of to be seen, but it also goes to show like Postgres running and in industry standards, like we really do want this legacy code. And also the, the re rationale behind kind of DuckDB and trying to gain some market share is to be able to not have to take all the legacy baggage with us. Um, so why would you want to embed on the edge? Well, it basically allows you, so we talked about UDFs, which are pushing application logic into a database in order to be able to run. Here we're doing the exact opposite. We're pulling a database into your application. So you get the full power and richness of, an app of a database to store the state of your application without the downsides of having to do remote RPCs. Um, the general trade-off or problem in this space, really where the core gap in this technology is, is that you kind of run into the scalability wall. So at some point in time, you're gonna be running with too much data to, or too much state to rerun local, and then you're gonna to wanna to spool out to the remote server to be able to process. Doing that seamlessly with two different database engines is traditionally very, or is a very difficult problem to solve. Um, so you're incrementally better because you have the same model both on your server and client to move forward, but you still have to handle all this management baggage of shifting data back and forth yourself. Um, so what is the problem that we're trying to address? I kind of mentioned this already, but it really is this in, in, interoperability and movement of compute and data across the system. So you wanna, every, uh, every node in the network topology or your stack, we wanna actually be able to execute and leverage the compute um, as well as push and store data on those, ideally with the same set of primitives. Uh, yeah, and this unlocks a whole slew of potential use cases. Um, so some of the stuff that we're looking at MotherDuck at solving in this, uh, this space, which I'll get a little bit into in a bit around how we're trying to tackle these problems, but um, like the, rough categorization of them. So ATL agent is the idea of you traditionally your application servers. So you can think of this, um, the stereotypical example of this would be like a logging server where you have basically all your application. So all the servers that are, that are like your network servers or your load balancer, et cetera, they can actually run with an embedded database agent on them or an agent with an embedded database um, that can do local processing store the logs locally, and then only push up filters, aggregates, and or really aggregated expressions up to the data marts that actually care about them. And then the data marts can in also federate out queries back down to the application nodes if you need the, the higher granularity. Um, so this basically allows you to actually leverage the full power of your servers as opposed to trying to centralize into a data lake and then running into scalability bottlenecks there. Um, as well as the cost. You already have a whole bunch of servers that are sitting, I mean, they are serving the actual load balance, or the load, load of the actual requests, but by and large, the disks on those are sitting idle, as well as you're just sending a whole bunch of network traffic up to the server and already network bound machines. Um, client side uh, encryption of data. So this is the idea that the client itself is the only one that actually stores keys 
and can query data that's actually encrypted in the database. Now you can do this using Hackly, using um, application node logic, but here you can actually embed this in the database itself. So it seamlessly, the apps, like you just write traditional SQL, and the client side is actually doing the decryption. So this is pure client side encryption. Um, yeah, in like not just sending over the key in some sort of cryptic form to decrypt on the server, but actually the server has no way of ever reading the information that's stored on it. Uh, data apps, there's kind of two different use cases here. So there's progressive rendering. So here's the idea, you downsample your kind of core data set so that it fits on a browser or whatever your client is. And then the client can run queries first against the downsampled data and then slowly render out to the full data set itself. Um, it obviously depends upon the actual use cases to how, um, how you do that kind of upsampling and how you present this out. But the idea is really you get this really fast, snappy UI because the query is all local, and then progressively you get the full fidelity if the user needs it. Um, and then sharded views is the idea of like the traditional data apps. A lot of them that are coming out to the market are kind of you're working with a SaaS provider, some really large data set, and really you only have a shallow view of it. There's some small partition of this data that you actually own and care about. And so this is more targeted at SaaS or um, or application kind of providers, but you can think of this as like a um, like a video game type use case where you care about all your local stats, et cetera, that are stored across, as well as maybe the global leaderboard. And those are the only two data sets that you'll ever be able to see. So all those that that data could actually be pushed down to the local local client itself, and each client kind of sees a small view, and the warehouse actually stores the entire thing but no queries have to go against the warehouse where it's trying to do these traditional partitions and like really work load balance across all these different clients. The clients just get the data set. So it's basically like models of pushing all the data out to like S3 objects and pulling those objects locally and querying them, um, but in a database setting. Uh, so next I wanna do a quick jump um, over to a similar technological movement, um, which I'm gonna parallel into what, how I see kind of the evolution of WASM going. So Hadoop and the rise of data lake. So essentially MapReduce, I think when it was A, solving a very similar problem. It was solving the problem of in a data center, so not across the entire network stack, getting the separation of storage and compute and being able to push compute down to storage nodes and be able to execute kind of on the reduce side, um, push data back up to reducers. Um, so some notable features there, they use the JVM to solve the same problem. They want to run over heterogeneous hardware. It's a lower cost. Um, the and then as kind of mentioned, the key primitives being the key, the map and reduce step, where the map over kind of keys tells you how data is being formed around the system. Um, and then also the reducers and the mappers are pushing compute down to the various nodes. So pushing compute onto the already sharded out, um, sharded out data on the, on HDFS, um, for the map stage and then on the reduce stage, being able to run um, reduce jobs on any node. Uh, so that's that kind of core funneling of the compute, um, which is our UDFs and the data, which is our traditional data now. Um, some learnings around here. So one key thing, and I think this is really the core theme that um, I'm gonna kind of move forward on is People really do love SQL and the expressiveness of the expressiveness and the ease of use of SQL as well as the optimizer. Like MapReduce, et cetera, like really took off when it got into Spark phase. Uh, MapReduce traditionally was a great starting point and but it really didn't see industry-wide adoption because of just how difficult it was to write a MapReduce job. Maybe you had to write the really, really robust like MapReduce 1.0 
versions of map and reducers with all their boilerplate code um, can appreciate that plus the, the hardness of debug is in a distributed setting, um, can really appreciate kind of how far we've come with Spark um, and really all the guarantees that it gets for you. Uh, the M plus one standard, so MapReduce basically was a counter movement against traditional data warehouses, which wrote everything in SQL and kind of this bespoke languages on top of them, PLS, SQL, et cetera. Um, so they came in and said, well, let's standardize a programming paradigm behind this, which introduced another standard of how to write things. And even now, there's still like this movements to Spark to become more and more like traditional SQL, but it's still a different standard. Um, so there's, there's a, this contention and trade-offs um, in the space, which I think has hampered a bit of how widespread Spark could, could have been. Um, and then this is completely separate from this talk, but the other place where Hadoop really hurt um, was around how managed offerings kind of worked, et cetera. Like we're getting into Spark on Kubernetes and these various kind of out-of-the-box solutions, but the original implementations of Spark relied very heavily on users to really take on the DevOps roles and be able to deploy on an entire cluster and be able to manage this. So you spent more time managing the infrastructure than you did writing code. Um, so road ahead. So we're really, really in the infancy of WASM, or, yeah, WASM in databases. The kind of core uh, movement is kind of, we can see it with the, sorry, the core movement to solve the problem of where compute and data is. We can, we can see it kind of come to life with these UDFs, which are hearkening to the map kind of phase of MapReduce, and then the reduce being able to run on the edge components, right? That, that kind of, we can start seeing some conceptualization of that today with the kind of UDF's capabilities and the WASM capability, or embedding of WASM on the edge nodes. Um, the core advantages of this over the traditional, say, Spark movement is like this actually is a seamless embedding of technology of, on the existing technology stack. Any existing technology stack could support this in theory. Now there's some practical limitations like Postgres running on your browser, <laughs> which like, I mean, you could always have some database that's Postgres compatible wire format that's stitching between these two things, but you can conceptually have this one seamless experience where you don't actually, you don't have to be aware of the topology of your system that the database itself is handling this, where it's X number of data nodes that are just coordinating amongst themselves. Uh, and then JVM versus WASM. Like WASM works on any technology, sorry, any, uh, existing language, et cetera, can run on WASM. It's pure, pure virtualization, like pure, a pure VM, right? That gives you all the, the, the ease of use and um, cross compatibility of a VM, but in whatever language you want, which like another huge thing with the push into to Java was like, it was around the same right time for Java taking off but we still have this huge fight around like the Java ecosystem versus what everyone else uses. Um, so like, I think this is kind of the core right synergy to, to have this, this level. Um, and various other very established speakers have talked about how WASM would have replaced Docker, WASM definitely would have replaced Java, like if we had it at that point in time. Okay, so walking through, as um, I showed before, kind of this hierarchy here. We had MapReduce, we have Hive, then Spark on data frames, Spark with the Catalyst Optimizer and Tungsten, and Spark, finally, Spark on Kubernetes. Um, so the Hive phase, I think, is our kind of up and coming where we're, we're heading in this space. So what was Hive for MapReduce? Hive for MapReduce was basically the first introduction of SQL into the MapReduce framework. What it does get, this really started to get a little bit of the optimizer in, as well as the usability aspects. People didn't have to write traditional MapReduce programs. They could now write Hive programs, which compiled into hideous, hideous, hideous MapReduce programs. Um, but like 
Hive still has huge adoption and is, most people who go and look at MapReduce stacks are using some Hive somewhere hidden in the store, even if it's just the metadata store in the catalog. Um, the, so where, how does this parallel into WASM? Um, at DuckDB, and you can see the beginnings at Substrate as well, we're starting to create hybrid execution models, which is you just write your traditional SQL, and across the edge database and your server databases, it breaks out into a parallelized plan. I'm gonna show some examples um, in the next couple slides of what this plan kind of looks like, but um, the core parts of this is that it naturally extends into UDFs. The UDF could be pushed either onto the server side or the, sorry, either onto the client or the server side, so it could run locally or remotely. Um, and it's already has this natural interface language between how SQL's interrupting with UDFs themselves. So the kind of API service layer, which is admittedly one of the hardest parts to get right about any new technology, especially embedding an existing technology, is already kind of established for us. Uh, so, it's a little bit cut off on the screen there, but this is a query plan of the query on the right here, which is selecting some custom polygon over a local set of suspected cars joined with the New York taxi, um, New York City taxi uh, open source data set. Um, so, in the query plan itself, you can see these nodes down here, which are the local nodes. Um, joining up against this remote execution, which is scanning the New York City taxi share rides um, up here. And then at the very, near the very top here, you can actually see the running of our custom WASM function uh, right here, or UDF rather, UDF written in WASM, but uh, that's not, not as important for, um, for the relevance of how this kind of embeds through here. But, this kind of showcases how a hybrid execution will work. So it can just look at the car, the, where the local data is and the remote data and make choices around where these things should run. And then the, the more relevant part as we start talking about optimization, et cetera, is that that UDF could get pushed in theory to the, the ride share sources itself and run over that if it finds that, say, the computer's too intensive on the, the, um, the server side and it makes more sense just to shard it out process on all nodes and then um, and, the, and then just do the filter on the remote side against the, the data set. So you can, the, the optimizer, if it's exposed to all these, these different metrics can in theory make a decision around these things. You can start to see how this could be stitched together, but the, the core part of where we are right now is just being able to have this one seamless plan that runs across both the server and the client. Uh, this is the reverse. I just put the local and remote. Um, now, Mother Duck, you can actually run these, this set of SQL. You can't actually embed custom UDFs yet. We're working on that. But um, everything else, these are actually query plans from Mother Duck. Uh, so the remote local here is you're querying, well, you're querying the same data set, but um, here you're running just remotely to scan over the suspected cars, and then here you have the local kind of funneling up. So like to make it a bit more realistic, um, this kind of toy example here would be something like you've basically pulled out a CSV or something about shared to you a set of interested cars that you're trying to probe for, um, where they're actually located across, whereas here would be something like you have a data science model which is actually doing the prediction of, here's a set of cars I need to be looking at, et cetera, which is much more computationally intensive. And then locally you have your, your small data set around, say, my little, like the, I'm a taxi company, I've got some small set of, um, of dispatch cars that I'm, I'm looking at, and then the full model remotely being across, you know, the whole New York City or something, that's all the possible taxi rides. Um, so that's kind of the, where we are right now and uh, what hybrid execution looks like. So next phase is data frames. So what did data frames introduce into Spark? Uh, 
Sorry, just checking time. Um, the data frames that's used into Spark is uh, data frames that's used into Spark really a regulation of the inputs and outputs. And this is where the component model fits really nicely on top of UDFs. So this is really the work that Substrate um, and Single Store is um, also kicking off, which is essentially how do you model inputs and outputs in a way that's composable across different data sets. So you have the UDFs, which are, like you compile any code against executions, and they're just traditional WASM. They're very much WASM programs. But the inputs and outputs, they vary depending upon, like your server could have data stored in columnar format, and your client could be storing in a row format. So traditionally, they're going to have very different optimization schemes of how things could be run across them. So you would want to potentially, like one's actually going to take leverage, um, vectorization, how it runs, et cetera. So being able to pull out or use modular components that can do kind of scans or an aggregate or sum over this data set, um, so which require both standardization of the input kind of format in a way that is agnostic to how it's underlying stored, and as well as the functions themselves in component in a component format, such that later your query plan can actually become aware of them. That's really where you can see the evolution and the data frame side can come into, and that's kind of having composable transforms as well as having composable inputs and outputs will allow kind of the UDF bridges to become properly optimized into the system, and you don't have to have this trade-off between do I write something in SQL or do I write it in UDFs? They, with WASM and components and proper virtualization, so Substrate's working on how a query plan would look like in a way that's agnostic to the environment that's running in. That's kind of what it was invented for. Um, single store is coming up with a standardization for WASI on how inputs of data, like basic traditional data frames would look like. Uh, Catalyst and tungsten, I'm really gonna quickly jump into this, but essentially, this is the optimization phase. So what Catalyst was, was the optimizer, was, is the optimizer of Spark. Um, that's just what it is. Uh, so it moved Spark from traditionally going in a volcano model, where it basically every primitive would just execute one at a time and pop up the entire stack for every row, to each operator having its, um, sorry, to the system being able to, to optimize and filter out parts that don't actually need to get executed across, et cetera. So just a traditional optimizer. Tungsten was creation of physical operators in Spark. So that actually was taking, you don't have to run in this volcano model, but you have actually compiled code that doesn't run in the JVM, um, so has that performance that performance boost, as well as is compiled for just what you've optimized against. So it doesn't have to deal with like overflows, et cetera, if you don't actually care about them. Um, so really up level the performance of Spark. So where does this come into WASM? This is again, as we start moving to standardize the UDFs on top of and the interfaces, then each implementation language could actually have, so your server and your client could have different forms of UDFs that, or different components that are exposed into the UDFs that you can plug and play as libraries into your code. So your code looks the same in terms of I just pull in a library that has this function, but that function is optimized differently on the client and the server, and that will just seamlessly work with the component model and some, some intelligent stitching and optimization on the client and server side, or rather the, the execution of the entire system. Uh, yeah, the WASM roadmap I kind of talked about, like just this is leading heavily on WASM components as a framework. That's kind of the biggest bottleneck and really the key thing that we need to figure out how we integrate seamlessly into in order to really move forward with this. Um, in addition to that, kind of bringing threading in and a bunch of other kind of just nice things that because we want to seamlessly interact with existing stacks, we definitely need, in order to pull it across, like currently you can, can leverage a lot of WASM today, but the hurdle of not being able to just take code and port it over directly is this big showstopper in most cases. That plus people worried about performance overheads. I think performance overheads we can deal with pretty easily by just showcasing the capabilities, 
but not saying that you have to write everything in single-threaded ways. And it actually is how the system will probably boil down to, but it is really a show shopper right now. Um, yeah, that leaves like five minutes for questions. <laughs> So, so the question was, um, how does uh, like an aggregator function itself and all its state management map into kind of linear memory? So a um, couple different answers here. So I think that's a great, great question. Um, so there, by and large, there's kind of this fight in the database community around do we leverage kind of the traditional kernel, et cetera, or how much do we write our own primitives? So in the teaser, for example, actually had a flat memory model for their entire space, and only when they ported it over to IBM, because they had their own custom hardware they originally launched, they actually, like, they ran X times faster on just a single memory space, and it's just a lot simpler to actually deal with linear memory. The great thing about WASM is actually it gives you that kind of abstraction yourself where you could just have that linear memory that's only isolated to the aggregator itself, and then you could have shared memory, say, if you're trying to to like, you could have the lower level operators share memory with the higher level operator, but the flat memory space itself and kind of the isolation of that model actually will allow a lot of simplification in the, the runtime execution of there, as well as kind of interesting your own custom paging, et cetera. So the question, it, and most of these things kind of boil down to is how much of the industry standards do we want to adopt versus um, kind of rolling our own, and that's, really going to be case by case independent. So from my personal experience, actually the flat memory model works really well, but you probably will hear if you ask someone else kind of the opposite opinions, which is like it doesn't really, it, it makes it hard to code against and like you'd have to roll your own abstractions. Yeah, that's that's one hundred percent correct. And that's like the the one biggest pain on database land is dealing with the kernel and anytime you get into that memory. Like most systems, like DuckDB, when we try to port it over to the cloud, it's just memory greedy. It just doesn't. It assumes whatever memory you're going to give to it, I want to run on. So getting that to run on containers in that environment is kind of a nightmare because you've isolated away from how much it knows about the host itself and. And that really does boil down to how much of the stack you want to build. But at least in my personal opinion, like the more and more serious you get into uh, uh, into database, like in, into building out these hardened systems and these runtimes, like the more and more you have to to kind of build on top of the the OS or build around the OS um, as opposed to just leverage it. But it is kind of this core blocker, and I this is a realm that I. And I still need to be really get educated across, but I know that WASM is also fighting this with the WASI framework, et cetera, around how much of the kind of core system libraries do they, they include from, from Linux, et cetera, and how much do they actually try to roll their own stack. And I think that also will help out with, with some of these concerns. Uh, and then the UDS themselves being like these modularized components, you could have two different models depending upon what your underlying operating system will actually support. So it's not like everyone has to make these kind of judgment calls. Uh, so for your first question, um, around the four gig limit, so WASM itself is, I think, already, well, is already in the WASI framework, and I think implemented on most of, most if not all, of the 
um, WASM runtimes is the 64-bit. So you have 64K memory space, you're not limited to 32-bit anymore. So you can map in larger pages. Um, and that's, but uh, getting that full adoption, and that's definitely a critical part of the runtime itself to get out of the 32-bit memory space to 64-bit memory space. Um, that being said, I know I mentioned it before, but the teaser actually did was a 32-bit memory space as well. So you can do some tricks around um, memory management, but by and large, our system is just becoming much larger, our data is becoming much larger, so 64 bits for every operator is probably a, a core requirement. Um, to your second question, could you rephrase that a little bit? Um, Oh, okay. So you're talking about, um, yeah. yeah, yeah. So traditional like document stores, graph databases, or just the NoSQL movement, new SQL movement. Um, so I can treat those separately. So the new SQL movement actually, in a lot of ways, it was a false dichotomy to talk about like MongoDB, et cetera. What they're really doing is trading off. Basically, I'm going to get rid of a core simple primitives like uh, atomicity or Sorry, uh, transactionality, sorry. yes, atomicity of the, um, the, sorry, blanking here, the core database primitives. Um, so the, the core part is that you're trading off these kind of core fundamentals to potentially get some performance improvements, but with UDFs, et cetera, you, like users can actually make some of these trade-offs themselves. So you could, it essentially becomes a different runtime inside the same environment that you could have, like UDS will work on document storage just as much as they work on uh, traditional relational databases. So like the short answer, long and short of that is like you just treat this as a different runtime that's running in and your function should be compatible across both of these two environments. Um, the slightly longer answer is actually I feel like with componentizations, these, these fundamental dichotomies actually will become less and less of a, a trade-off that users have to make themselves. Like, do I want to run on MongoDB versus Postgres and the characteristics of these different things? Like, I just write my functions and the optimizer kind of figures out, can I lack some things down? Especially because you have a full closure now that's handling retriability and various different things like that. So depending upon what functions you call in, kind of you can, it can figure out which modes you actually, the user's trying to express, where traditional SQL just doesn't have the expressivity to make those trade-offs for you. Yes, yeah, right now, um, well, so document storage, et cetera, are definitely out of scope. Um, relational databases are, now graph databases and things like that are usually actually built on top of relational databases, as well as a lot of data science type models. So DuckDB itself actually has extensions that work in um, graph models as well as on relational, sorry, as well as on more, like it's, it's primary, one of its primary use cases is actually data science models and, and running on, on those type of systems which are more kind of MapReduce type focus in how their workloads are. All right, I think we're over time as well, so I'm happy to take any questions off, offline. Thank you.